ready to go when you are. All right. Hey, folks. Scott Pickett here. For 35 years plus now, I've been doing this, and uh, it never gets old. And uh, normally, I don't operate in North America. I've been worldwide for the last 20 years. And uh, whenever I come back to North America to do presentation work, it always seems that I'm coming back to the Washington Area Users Group. This is my second time that I remember here. Uh, I want to talk to you today about a little bit about uh, Informix and JSON. This is a feature we released way back in 2013. And I did a lot of presentation work on it at the time and over the next several years, as did Carl Doe here in North America. So what is JSON and what does it mean for you? Well, first of all, you have to understand that we have this concept of uh, hybrid apps. That is to say, we can take no SQL data based on JSON and combine that with SQL data, which we are all lovely familiar with, in all the same database, same instance, same server, and in the same apps which makes it very interesting to use because you can get the best of both worlds. So JSON grew up with the idea that we'd have rapid application prototyping. Schema rides as objects inside a JSON script and not as a separate item. It allows you to have constant unit test and retest as your logic expands. In the world of JSON, application programmers are often the database administrators and the system administrators basically they do everything and on top of that the application life cycles are usually less than 90 days and this is very frequent in the retail business where they have to swap out new applications almost every month so it's less bureaucratic it scales we don't do it by database tuning at least not the way we're used to doing it in the world of Informix, but rather we do something called sharding, which is we take a collection, which is a table by <coughs> end of the name in Informix, and scale it by sharding out on a key of a table, the necessary data across cheap, inexpensive commodity hardware all networked together. And there's a, some automatic data rebalancing that can go on here between the shards on the key fields during the shard operation. The end result is you have less downtime and more uptime and more scalability all at once and a quicker project completion time. A lot of these SQL customers and no SQL customers are the same customers. They're enterprise, they have both relational and non-relational database sitting in the same facility, and they need to make sense of the data they have for business purposes. And some NoSQL databases have more transaction capabilities than others, and some have none at all. Within Informix, we will enforce transactions on all application statements with consistency ensured at the end of the transaction. And it's transactional, encrypted, and handles SQL and NoSQL data in the same instance and in the same database and in the same table slash collection all at once. We don't need to have separate servers. I got called to a customer site one day to find out that the customer had 275 NoSQL servers. They had taken sharding to the extreme. And the CEO sat in the office and threw me a stack of bills. The bills were electric utility bills, the cost of each and every one of the servers. And I was looking at one year's bills, and they were worth more in cost to the company than they were making in profit. So needless to say, they wanted to do some consolidation. Joining NoSQL and SQL-based queries in the same statement is also possible with Informix. And we're going to have some examples that we can show you later on. Many customers using NoSQL in production circumstances with large document stored databases have to join the data to their existing SQL database repositories for business purposes and often stored, housed, and queried separately on different servers. We can join the two kinds of data in Informix. The document store portion relies natively in a BSON data type according to the International BSON Standard. 
as a single row data type within Informix, accessible as JSON, with a full set of functions to access the document stored data. So, what kind of industries typically you get used? You, I'm sorry, typically use this particular kind of database. And you're looking at some of them right here on the screen. Notice that a lot of them have the general overall theme of social media and communications media. If you're in one of these industries, chances are somebody in your industry is that you know is using it. So customers in justifying this is non-traditional data management requirements driven by Web 2.0 companies almost eight years ago now. Document stored databases, key value stored databases, and more recently graph and columnar databases. With three Vs, the thing that they're looking for the most, high frequency of data ingest, lots of volume, big data, and variability with unstructured data, flexibility in the schema design. We support both JSON, which is the visible data, and BSON, which is the binary JSON, and that's what you store things in, in BSON, and it's implemented to industry standards, JSON.org and BSON.org. Scale-out requirements across a heterogeneous environments, cloud computing. Typically, this is where these things can be seen today and in increasing numbers. So no SQL means nothing more than not only SQL and not allowing SQL. And it's a non-relational database management system. It doesn't have a fixed schema. It avoids join app operations at all costs. And if it has to do a join, it is an application join, and you'll get mighty familiar with tools like SED and GREP and things like that if you have to do application joins. And it scales horizontally, and only now are some of these databases coming in with ACID compliance, but most of them in the field are not ACID compliant. And it's excellent with distributing data and fast application development. And this is where a lot of application developers have gone. So ACID means atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And it's an eventual consistency model in many cases. What that means is I could have seven inserts and four of them will eventually find their way there to the right target eventually we don't know exactly when we just know that they will eventually get there yes i know it sounds like heresy in the world of transactional databases but this is what they do there's no joins as i said earlier usually a single row or document lookup and they have flexible schemas whereas in the sql world we have a rigid format for ours. We think that mobile computing is where it's at for this, and it represents one of the greatest opportunities for organizations to expand their businesses, requiring mobile apps to have access to all relevant data. We have a relatively new customer in Indonesia. This customer has built a mobile banking app based on Informix. I conducted a session out there in Indonesia where the entire class was nothing but programmers and they were taking up the larger version of this particular presentation. And then they went right out and implemented on stage one, their mobile banking app. And today they're up and running four years in a row, all of it running on top of Conformix. Currently we're up to version 4.2 of the MongoDB API to get mobile apps and the developers, the ability to combine critical data managed by Informix with the next generation of mobile apps. And Informix JSON lets developers leverage the abilities of relational database systems along with document store systems and all in one database, in one instance, on one server, and if necessary, in a single table. 
So some of the things that we can do, I'm not gonna read all these. Yes, it's green in the background to wake everybody up. And some more. Some of these are obviously SQL based, but they do work. So some basic translation and concepts and terms. On the left, we have no SQL. And on the right, roughly, we have the traditional SQL. And I don't really need to explain too many of these things. You're all pretty much familiar with the SQL. The document here on the left can be up to two gig in size in Informix stored in the BSON column, which is our biggest single selling point. The formal definition of a collection. In order for us to access both SQL and NoSQL data at one, at one time, the NoSQL portion of it goes through something called the wire listener, which we'll discuss in the slide. And that wire listener is looking for a table behind the scenes that says create collection table. And if it sees that, well, it's going to be very happy and it will have minimally at least two of the four columns that you see here on the screen. And one of those columns will be the ID. And the other one is very likely to be the column called data. And the data will be a BSON column de definition. And the ID is always unique and it's 128 characters in length. All collection tables and informics can hold JSON documents, have the same basic four column names and data type definitions as seen as above, and only the collection table name changes. Standard DDL subclauses can apply, like the lock mode and the extent size, whether it's compressed, that sort of thing. And JSON documents are stored whole in binary format in the column called data, and queries from both JSON and SQL can access this data. And there's a whole slew of functions used to pull apart all that data that's located in that column called data. So this is your wire listener in theory. Whoops, what happened? Okay. And we can go back and forth through the wire listener. The MongoDB is what it's based on. We can do this from mobile or a web browser or a native client. And the wire listener supports existing MongoDB drivers who connect to a MongoDB or Informix with the same app. And there is a configuration file called JSON listener jar. I have to edit that and we'll see that in a moment. But to start this up on the command line, there's a lot of very, very tiny code sitting here at the very bottom of the screen, and that's how you do it. The standard port that we, the wire listener listens on is 27017, shown here on the screen at the bottom. I'm not sure that anybody in the audience here on knew, other than the, the Informix veterans, of long standing that we could actually do this sort of thing. Uh, I was informed that uh, it might be a good presentation. So that is why I'm here present presenting this today. If that, um, if I'm mistaken or we were mistaken in doing this, our apologies. That is why I'm here. So to start and stop your wire listener, because it's important to know how to do that. 
And have a look at the jsonlistener.log. It will put messages in there, such as what you see on the screen. And both JSON and Informix SQL commands go into the log. And a whole bunch of commands and so forth right here on the screen. This is to essentially bring in your new configuration and start it up or shut it down. The editable properties file is located in dollar and form exterior Etsy. I highly recommend that you edit a copy of it and leave the original as is and use the copy. Similar to our longstanding practice of talking about our onconfig.std file. So these are some of the environment variables that you would use in configuration parameters is actually a better better statement to say than environment variables for the JSON listener properties. Now you can put other things in here too, but these are just some of the things that you do. Uh, local host, the actual connection string, password is encrypted, as you can see. I wouldn't give I wouldn't put a password in there like that. Listener ports defined. If you wish to have SQL execute, if you wish to do things like enterprise replication, you will need the SQL security pass through and the sharding enable and the update client strategy set to some of the values that you see here on the screen. There's a whole bunch of others. There's a whole section in the manuals on the wireless configuration file and the various different configuration parameters. I suggest highly you take a look at it. It's got a lot more in it than what I'm showing right here. There are approximately 70 or 80 items in there at this point. Parameters of the file are one per line and settings are not dynamic as of the original wirelessener configuration file. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure they're not now. If I'm, if they are, please correct me. Enable sharding collections in JSON. You have to turn on sharding enable true. And if you want to turn that on, you also have to set one more parameter, namely the update client strategy. And you have to set that to delete insert in order to just set up sharding collections properly. To do SQL pass through through JSON based apps, you have to set the SQL security pass through equals true. Username and password are optional, and if you don't set this, the OS authentication is used in its place. Informix server is usually a reserved port and not the main server instance port and is found in Etsy services and SQL hosts. So some of the features, and there are a lot of them, but some of the things you can do, you get a flexible schema using JSON and BSON as a data type. Complete rows are stored in a single column. They're multi-representational types and can store up to gigabytes in a single record. It's massive. It's larger than MongoDB is at this time, eight years later. You can access key value pairs within JSON. Translating Mongo queries into SQL expressions to access key value pairs. Adding new expressions to extract specific key value pairs. As seen here on the screen. You can do indexing, both typed and typeless. Typeless means we don't know what the data type of the column is. Typed means we do know, and so we can choose the appropriate BSON value function. And there are a bunch of them, and we'll see those in a couple of slides. And we support indexing BSON keys with different data types. We support range and hash-based charting. We have built-in technology, as you know, for our replication, and we build over the top of enterprise replication the ability to do our sharding. And we create identical tables and multiple nodes through sharding, different key value. Otherwise, the tables are identical. And we add metadata for partitioning the data across 
the various different shards based on range or hash expressions. So we could do updates, inserts, deletes, updates shown on screen as seen. Inserts are simple direct inserts. Deletes are deleting a statement with the BSON extract or a BSON value clause. Updates are BSON update of an expression, returns a new BSON after applying the BSON expression. The simple updates to non-sharded tables will be directly updated update statements in a single transaction. At the top, I skipped it, my apologies. The selects, there's limited support required for shardings. MongoDB disallows joins. So the end result is, is single sharded tables get transformed into a federated union all query, including shard elimination processing. In a sharded environment, all the rows are on inserts are updated to, are inserted to a local shard. The replication threads will read logs and replicate to the right shard and delete from the local node. Deletes do a local delete and replicate the delete statements to a target node in the background. And updates are slow updates via select, delete, and insert. Transactions, we support transactions and each statement is a distinct transaction in a single node environment and the data and the operation are replicated via enterprise replication, and we will see some code samples of that in a few slides. For locking, application controls only on the lock that they're connected to. Standard Informix locking semantics will apply when data is replicated and applied in the target shard. We also support isolation levels. No SQL can support any of the standard Informix isolation levels, any of them. Hybrid access. From MongoDB to relational tables, inserts, all rows inserted to local shards, replication threads will read the logs and replicate to the right shard and delete from the local node. For deletes, we do the local delete and replicate the delete statements to the target nodes in the background. And for updates, slow updates via select, delete, and insert. For hybrid access, we directly get a BSON or cast to JSON to get in a textual form. You will see a lot of code where we have done just exactly that, where we cast from BSON to JSON and also sometimes to other types. And we'll see some code on that in a minute. We use expressions to extract to, to, extract to specific key value pairs. No SQL collections will only have one BSON object in the table. We can apply the expressions when the SQL refers to a column seen below. So for a flexible schema, the clients can exchange BSON documents with the server for both queries and data. Thus, BSON is a fundamental data type. Explicit key value pairs within JSON BSON documents will be roughly equivalent to columns in relational tables, but there are some differences. This is the most important thing. The data types, the type of the data and the key value pair within BSON is determined by the client, not the server. The server in the BSON column is unaware of the data type of each key value pair at table definition time. The application must keep track of the data types of the data. Going back to the first slide where I said that the primary difference is, is that the application controls everything, and that is true here. No guarantees the data type for each key will remain consistent in the collection. The keys in the BSON document can be arbitrary. Due to the limitations of Mongo's API, customers denormalize everything in a table. So this third normal form is not something you normally see. Schema actually grows into being a typically denormalized schema. 
So as for the BSUN data type, it was new as of 2013, obviously not new now. We also have a JSON data type to convert between binary and text form, and they're abstract data types like spatial, and they're also multi-representational. Objects, for those of you who like to get into the tuning aspect of it, objects up to 4K are stored in data pages. Larger objects up to 2 gig are stored out of row and in blobs. And Mongo limits objects currently to 16 megabytes. It's all seamless and transparent. So what does it look like behind the scenes? I mentioned earlier, we had some functions. These are the various different extract functions at the top that return the base type of the data that they are trying to seek. <coughs> there are also expressions returning a BSON subset and it's used primarily in BSON indices. And we'll see some of those in a moment. And then there are expressions to project out of a select statement. So some comparisons, no SQL 101, differences between SQL and no SQL. SQL equivalent on the right. So one of the things I found myself doing was eventually to write some of the more complex NoSQL things, I was writing in NoSQL because as you can see on the last one here on the screen, there's about twice as much code that needs to be written to get the same data. So that's something that will probably happen to you too. Notice the double casting on JSON to BSON in some of these statements and the casting on the data column itself in whole to JSON in the fourth one. It's very syntaxy. So as I said earlier, we have transactions. So you can enable transactions for a current session in the current database, disable it, print its status, commit it, roll it back. This is all true for non-charted queries. And there's also execute, and it runs a batch of commands as a single transaction. Transaction mode's not enabled for a session, Parameter enables transaction mode for the duration of the transaction. Man documents include insert, update, delete, find, and modify, and find. Use a find command to run SQL and NoSQL queries, but not commands. A find command can also include the dollar order by, limit, skip, and sort operators, for example. And the following example deletes a document from the inventory collection and inserts documents into the archive collection. The execute parameter has an optional finally argument if you have a set of command documents to run at the end of the transaction, regardless of whether or not the transaction is successful. And you can do things like this. Here's a batch of commands aimed at primarily setting up the environment for IWA. So you can run Informix things from inside of NoSQL. Amongst those is compression, for example which I have a slide for in the larger deck, but I don't think it's here. So 
I said earlier, you could see a transaction session in progress. So this is playing around on the command line. The first thing you always execute when you go into a MongoDB environment is you say use database name. In this case, you'll see at the very first line here at the top of the slide, it says switch to DB stores demo. So above that, which was cut off because I had to fit it on the screen, I say use stores demo. And voila, it comes back and says, okay, I switched to it. Every command that's successful after that comes back with a okay equals one, meaning, hey, you did well. Next step. So here we're doing inserts, finds. Simple, no SQL to insert records and find data coming back. And everything comes back in curly brackets. E value pairs. So here's another command line operation where we do updates and deletes in Mongo. It's called remove. Notice in between we're committing. So we can also create and drop indexes. Why have they ever called it insure indexes beyond me, but that's how you create indexes. Now these are non-unique indexes in each case. Supports B-tree indexes on any key value pair. Indices can be on simple ba basic types or on a BSON. Indexes can be created on BSON and use BSON type comparisons. The listener translates ensure index to create index and drop index to drop index. Some, some code. Now I said earlier that you would get used to writing things in Mongo in a hurry. And if you look at this, you can look at all the syntax. You'll probably want to do things in Mongo. On the left is the Mongo, and on the right is the standard Informix SQL query to do, I mean, statement to do each one of these create indexes. Please note the last one is a unique index. So sometimes examples are useful. On the command line, if you want to enter the Mongo environment, you type Mongo. And you get use new DB, switch to database new DB, and then you off you go and you execute your statements. So as you can see above, you see the customer's insurer index, quarter date of one. And down below, Formix SQL equivalent. Functional indexes built on BSON expressions. EBW find X1 gets translated to what you see at the bottom of the screen. I'm lazy. I don't like writing code any more than anybody else does, so I find myself doing a lot of Mongo stuff when I'm working with this. Takes a little bit of memory on the syntax, though. So you can also run SQ explain. Notice the casting, the red. What kind of indexes do I have? So on a particular table, in this case, or a tip, um, I see I made the mistake. 
in a particular collection, because this would have to be a collection for it to come back properly. Won't come back at all if it was a table. So city info is my collection and I wanna see all the indexes on it. So I say DB city info two, get indexes. And what do you see? You see all of the indexes that it knows about. There are a very large number of different functions that we can use in Informix. And this is just a taste of it. Um, at this point, it's eight years old and it's very mature. It works quite well and we have customers using it. So you can also do your isolation levels and you can set it in DB open if you want, at sysdb open. And you can always use these last committed. And you're using, if you're using procedures for executing multi-statement transactions, you can set it within your procedure. Locking, standard page level locking is the normal default, but you can change this to row like you always do. You can do it in Informix, or actually you can actually do it in MongoDB. And uh, there's a uh, function that allows you to do this that I showed you a little bit earlier. You can run any SQL statement inside of it and it will run. Go back to the slides to see that. So to sum up, to finish up, because as I said, this is a, an abbreviated presentation of what was originally 370 slides. So what do we offer customers and developers? And I think the answer is you wanna think hybrid. So you get a hybrid database and apps with SQL and no SQL syntax, single multi-instance, single multi-database, multi-multi instance and databases, machines. Single multi-statement and partial transactions with two-phase commit. Encryption at rest and on the wires, their backups are encrypted, you get compression. You get free backup and restore utilities and a storage manager to tape, disk, or remote. You get sharding, heterogeneous table, full instance replication, rolling upgrades. Free connection managers to all server types, scaling out, scaling up secondary servers with shared disk, master-slave or master-master replication, user-defined data types, geospatial data types, spatial data types, time series basic text search, native JSON and BSON with MQTT and REST support. You get configurable database server autonomics and graphical administration. You get a free Informix developer or innovator C product addition if you want to do small scale production work on Innovator C, you can use it for production. You can use Informix Developer to do full scale development. It's hosted on multiple clouds or you can bring your own license to the cloud. You get the in-memory Informix Warehouse Accelerator which gives query answers in milliseconds, processing at nanoseconds. And you get the legendary uptime based on five nines, which many customers have told us about over the years and posted on various different presentations and chat rooms over the years. It's stable, easy stand up time measured in years. And all of it on one or possibly two physical machines if replicating with one user database in one instance, one electricity bill, one cost. Why that last statement? Because a lot of customers using pure no SQL databases have massively large hardware costs and electricity bills, more importantly. And with that, I'm done. <laughs>